Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a 14 and a half inch Starmaster telescope. What is it? Well, it's an astronomical telescope designed for looking up at the night sky. There's a mirror at the bottom of this mirror box here which gathers light, in this case quite a bit of it, about 14 and a half inches worth. It focuses the light into a secondary mirror which you can't see buried underneath this circular structure here and out towards the eyepiece and this is where you look. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. Now as you saw in the head note, this telescope was donated to our club by the estate of a club member who passed away and it is going to wind up in our observatory eventually where I'm sure it's going to teach a lot of people a lot of things. Uh, so the creator of this telescope and the owner of the company is Rick Singmaster. He himself also passed away in April of 2020, and so this was considered sort of a legacy review. There won't be any more Star Masters, at least not in their present form. I first met Rick Singmaster back in 1998 or 1999 at the AstroFest Star Party in Kankakee, Illinois. And in fact, I was accompanying a club member who was buying a 20-inch Obsession that's one of the competing brands, and I wanted to go with him because partially I just wanted to see the deal go down. Well, across the aisle from Dave Kriege, who was running the Obsession booth, was another premium telescope manufacturer, my name's Star Master, which at the time I hadn't heard of. And it was interesting to see the contrast between the two men. Dave Kriege at Obsession is sort of this call, tall, quiet guy, and Rick Singmaster, well, he looked like this sort of cowboy dude sitting in a lawn chair, smoking a cigarette. Uh, very interesting looking guy, but anyhow, my friend did buy the 20 inch Obsession and all through the rest of that weekend, I kept coming back to the Star Master booth because I was really intrigued by how sharp the optics were. Today we know Carl Zambudo as one of the premier mirror manufacturers, but at the time I didn't know who he was. All I knew is that the Star Master telescopes were really, really sharp. And I decided eventually that I have to have one of these things. So I wound up buying Rick's show demo of the 10 inch EL, that's the extra light version, 10 inch F6 Dobsonian reflector. And my friend who had already bought the 20 inch obsession wound up buying Rick's show demo sample of the 12 and a half inch EL. So if you did order one of the larger Star Masters, Rick was sometimes reluctant to ship it to you, and instead what he would do is, if he had a lot of them on order, he would, you know, put it in his truck, drive it out to you from Kansas, and uh, sometimes he would set up a route along the way where he would drop off lots of them. And this is what happened to us back in the early 2000s. I had a friend order one of the larger ones, and that's us looking through the telescope, and he would tell us about certain design decisions he'd made, he'd tell us about the telescopes, and he would give us lessons on collimation. I remember that night because he taught me a thing or two about collimation that I didn't know. Gestures like this, large and small, inspired a kind of passionate loyalty among Rick's customers. I know some of you who have owned three, four, or five or more Star Master telescopes, and apparently some of you display them in your homes like fine furniture. This includes one club member, I don't know if he wants me saying his name, but he has owned 11 Star Masters, 11, all the way from the seven inch old classic up to a 22 incher. And by the way, as far as I know, that is a record of sorts. If anybody can beat that, please leave a message in the comments below. I'm sure we'd all love to hear from you. So this one is a 14 and a half inch and by Objective telescope standards, this is pretty big, but in the world of the big daub, it's considered more of a midsize, and it might even be towards the small side of that. The 15-inch class of Dobsonian is important for many manufacturers because it is the largest, usually the largest one that you can buy where you can keep both feet on the ground. At the time it was introduced, somewhere around $4,000 for the base telescope. If you wanted the electronics package, which this one has, that is the Sky Commander and the go-to motor modules, you could count on adding another $2,600 or so, plus any accessories or upgrades, including the wheelbarrow handles, an extra shroud like this, the secondary dew heater, and the feather touch focuser upgrade. If you ever find yourself in a position to get one of those focusers, I highly recommend that as an upgrade. Those are beautiful focusers. 
towards the end of its production run somewhere in the mid 2010s, the price had risen quite a bit. With the Zambudo mirror, the price had gone up to 79.95. At that point, there was a slightly less expensive mirror option you could buy for somewhere in the mid 6000s. Prices on all the other things had gone up as well. So towards the end of its production run to get a telescope equipped like you see right here, somewhere between 11 and $12,000. So in talking to Rick through the years, I'm always surprised at how concerned he was over observer safety. For example, when you were assembling the telescope, he always wanted you to put the eyepiece on the right-hand side. Why is that? Well, if you're up on a ladder, which you probably won't be on something like this, when you're tracking the sky, you have a tendency to pull the scope towards you. Eventually, you're gonna pull the scope into the ladder, realize that you've got to move it, and you'll go down and move the ladder and go back up again. If the eyepiece was on the left side of the telescope, you're going to be gradually pushing the telescope away from you, and you may not realize how big that gap is in the dark, and he just didn't want you leaning over in the dark. Second thing is you'll notice the F-ratio on these Star Masters tends to be somewhat smaller than on some of the other premium Dodd manufacturers. The reason for this is you want it to make the telescope as short as possible so that you don't have to get on the step stool or the ladder in the first place. Now one disadvantage of doing this is that any fast mirror, even one this good, is going to have some distortion at the edges, we call it coma or other aberrations, and there's unavoidable really. But there's a fix that we have, and it's called a paracor, and this is made by Teleview. It looks kind of like an eyepiece. There's been a couple of different versions of this, but it slips right in the focus through here, and there's a lens element in there that corrects for these edge aberrations, and it works very, very well. They run for around $500 or so, I think, and I don't believe that was included in the base price of the telescope. And it was designed actually for you to leave it in there full time and you won't even uh, know it's there after a while. You just put the eyepiece in here as if uh, it was just in the focuser itself. So I noted in my 2001 review that the Sky Commander seemed really good. And in using this now for the past few nights, I have to agree, even by today's standards, it is quite accurate. It's a little bit dated right now. It doesn't have GPS. Uh, it doesn't talk to you. There's no keypad. But what it does, it does very, very well. It points and goes to the objects, and it is very, very accurate. What I find uh, with the keypad here, it's only got six buttons on it, which is a little bit inconvenient. So if you're dialing in a particular object, you're gonna be like pecking at the buttons and moving the cursor and pecking the buttons again. You get used to it, but it would have been nice if there's a keypad. Now, if you look at the instruction manual for the Sky Commander, you might be surprised just how versatile this thing is. This can do a lot, including, you know, if you put it on an equatorial tracking table, you can compensate for that, and it does a lot of other things as well. So I did a dummy align indoors like this, and if you want to see it move, what it does is I've got it going like this, and it will move. This passes, by the way, the noise test that some astronomers like to use. It, uh, the better go-to systems tend to be somewhat quieter. The louder ones sometimes sound like coffee grinders. Uh, also, the instruction manual warns you against uh, standing too close to the telescope when it's moving. It can come over and hit you. Okay, so I've had people ask me, do I have to use the go-to system? No, you do not. Maybe sometime you don't feel like doing the initialization. Sometimes you just feel like pushing it around yourself. That's fine. You can just turn the motors off. There's a switch on the black box. It's very clearly labeled. And then you have to release the two clutches because the motors are in the normal position clutching both of the axes. And I'll show you the one down here. This is the one on the uh, altitude axis, but there's a black lever here, and you can see as I'm turning this, the motor housing swings up and down. And the motor housing swings up, it's contacting the side bearing, and it will move the telescope. If I wanna use it manually, I'll turn this down like this. There's another axis on the azimuth. I won't show you that, I've gone ahead and released that. But if you do that, you can just move the thing around yourself. Now here's something else you wanna keep in mind. You can turn the go-to off, but leave the Sky Commander on. If you do a two-star line, the encoders know where the telescope is pointing. So if you're having problems finding a particular object, you can always ask it where it is, and it will tell you how far off you are, and you just sort of look down, and it sort of counts down and lets you know where it is. Be a nice little assistant. In this mode, we call it a push-to mode. So you can use it in go-to mode with the motors, you can use it in push-to mode with just the Sky Commander, 
or if it's your preference, you can turn all of the electronics off and just use it manually. So what can you see with this? Well, I noticed the bigger the telescope that you have, the books that you read tend to get thicker. Uh, one of the ones I use is Uranometria. That goes pretty deep, and one of my favorite deep sky observing guides is called the Deep Sky Observer's Guide, and that's a hardcover book that's so big it's in three volumes. But what you'll find is that familiar objects take on a new kind of personality, and galaxies in particular, which tend to look like the same featureless fuzzes in most mortal-sized telescopes, begin to take on a personality of their own. If you think you know a particular area of the sky pretty well, one cure for that is to get a bigger telescope, and it may convince you you don't really know it as well as you think you do. I think I know that area around M82 and M81 fairly well. There are a number of satellite galaxies around there, but as you're sort of driving around that area, sometimes you'll run across something and you'll be like, wait, what's that? I never saw that before. Another example is the NGC 3190 galaxy in LEO. You can usually tell about what size telescope a person has by how they refer to that object. If you've got a four, or six, eight inch telescope, you probably refer to that as the NGC 3190 galaxy. If you've got a bigger telescope, you tend to refer to it as the NGC 3190 galaxy group. There is at least four galaxies really tightly intertwined. I was looking at those the other day, really pleasing view through this telescope. So if you're curious about the design differences between the Star Master and the Obsession, I've got the 14 and a half inch Star Master here with the 12 and a half inch Obsession. Yeah, it's not apples to apples. To really do this right, I need the 15 inch Obsession here, but I don't have one of those right now. But you'll see the construction philosophies are very similar. There's an upper truss assembly that's round. There's the mirror box assembly, and then there are the truss poles in between. Some minor differences, the Obsession uses eight individual truss poles, and they sit on the outside of the rocker box. With the Star Master, there are four of these A-frames, and they sit inside the rocker box. As a result, aperture for aperture, the Obsessions tend to be a little smaller and a little lighter than the Star Masters. And just for completeness sake, here's what the two telescopes look like when they are disassembled. So there you have it, an overview of the 14 and a half inch Star Master Dobsonian Telescope. And again, we at the New Hampshire Astronomical Society express our great gratitude towards the estate of the club member who passed away in donating this to us. It is going into our observatory where I'm sure it will educate and entertain people for many years to come. And as for Rick Singmaster himself, well, all I can say is those who judged him by his gruff appearance were missing out. He was one of the kindest people I've ever met. He always seemed to have time to talk to you. And I think what I'm going to miss most about him is that hearty laugh of his. He loved to laugh. And maybe I like to think that there's a little piece of Rick in every one of these telescopes that he's manufactured and that he's left behind for all of us to enjoy. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.